In this unit, we're going to take a look at organic chemistry, which is the study of compounds containing carbon and hydrogen mostly, along with some of the important nonmetals in the upper right corner of the periodic table like nitrogen, oxygen, and the halogens. Carbon is a very interesting element because it can form up to four single bonds, and we can chain carbons together to form molecules with a huge structural diversity. The structural diversity of organic compounds is truly staggering with millions upon millions of organic compounds known to chemists today. To get a handle on that insane structural diversity, we need some fundamental principles of properties, structure, and reactivity. And that is essentially the purview of organic chemistry, the study of the properties and reactivity of carbon-containing compounds. So here we're only going to be able to scratch the surface, introduce some fundamental ideas, fundamental units found within organic compounds that we'll call functional groups, and we're going to take a bit of a deeper look at a couple of oxygen-containing classes of organic compounds, the alcohols and the ethers. This content, by the way, is primarily based on sections 21 and 20.2 of the OpenStax Chemistry 2e text. So this chapter in that text is focused on organic chemistry, and we're going to stop at 20.2 just due to time constraints for the moment. So what are we going to be able to do? at the end of this unit. Well, we're going to learn how to draw and interpret skeletal structures of organic compounds, recognize and classify what are called hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons contain carbon and hydrogen in some proportion, something like CNHM is the formula of a hydrocarbon containing carbon and hydrogen. We're going to see how the concept of isomerism applies in organic chemistry. Because of that structural diversity associated with carbon-containing compounds that we mentioned earlier, isomerism is extremely, extremely common in organic chemistry. So, for example, if you take a formula like C6H14, which is a typical formula for a six-carbon saturated hydrocarbon, as we'll see, there are a variety of different ways to link the carbons together to create a variety of isomeric compounds. And we'll learn how to enumerate some of those, drawing isomers with a given molecular formula, and a little bit about how to think about those. Then we'll dig into some specific oxygen-containing functional groups, as we mentioned, the alcohols and the ethers. And these contain oxygen, and this gives them some interesting properties, which will eventually, when you get to your organic chemistry courses, generalize out to other compounds, other classes of compounds containing what are called heteroatoms. Heteroatoms are any carbon that is not carbon, uh, any atom that is not carbon or hydrogen. Let's start with the basic question. What is organic chemistry? Organic chemistry is the study of compounds that contain skeletons of carbon and hydrogen, and these are known as organic compounds. Now, the specific mention of skeletons containing carbon and hydrogen is interesting and actually pretty important because there are a number of carbon-containing compounds that we generally don't think of as being in the purview of organic chemistry. For example, something like calcium carbonate, CaCO3. This does contain carbon, but it basically contains carbon in an inorganic form, in the carbonate anion, right? So this is generally not considered an organic compound. One that's a little more ambiguous is carbon dioxide, CO2. This doesn't contain any metals in its molecular formula, and it's arguably an organic compound, but it doesn't contain any hydrogen, which sort of puts it in this ambiguous place where we're not sure whether that's organic or not. And you'll find, I think, moving forward that it's convenient to think about CO2 in an organic way, thinking about that carbon as essentially two what you'll call carbonyl groups in one. But it's highly debatable whether CO2 is organic or not. But if we constrain ourselves to compounds that contain a skeleton of carbon and hydrogen that we can think of as hydrocarbon derivatives, where hydrogen is replaced with some other group, we're pretty reliably in the territory of organic compounds. And organic compounds are found everywhere. Living systems, they're the most important class of compounds in biochemistry. Synthetic materials, organic polymers are found everywhere. The clothes you're wearing, the car you're driving, absolutely everywhere. And of course, the environment. Organic compounds are important uh, aspects of our natural world as well. And organic chemists are basically concerned with the physical and chemical properties of organic compounds. 
How do they react? Those are the chemical properties. What are their melting points, boiling points, optical rotation, solubility, all those physical properties. Organic chemists are worried about all these kinds of things. And often what organic chemists will do is try to construct organic molecules with relatively complex molecular structures. Complex structure gives rise to complex function is one way to think about this. And so the more diverse structures we can make, the more diverse functions we can achieve. And by combining different types of organic reactions together into multi-reaction sequences, we can start with simple starting materials and build up complex products. And this is the domain of what's called organic synthesis, whose goal is to create these complex products from simple starting materials using known organic reactions. Now, when you actually get to your organic chemistry courses, you'll realize that organic chemistry is very different from the typical chemistry you do in your inorganic in your introductory courses. Rather, um, it's more visual than quantitative, for starters. It's essentially a visual language. So when you solve problems, you'll be doing so through the visual langu language of structures, reaction schemes, and mechanisms. And you'll be drawing and thinking about a lot of reaction mechanisms. I won't say too much about this for the time being, but pushing electrons like this is generally how we think about organic reaction mechanisms. So everything you've learned about mechanisms to date still holds true. Rate determining steps and rate laws and all that good stuff still holds in an organic con context. But our focus shifts from that sort of quantitative angle to the more qualitative, how are structures changing? How are electrons moving? What bonds are being made and broken? And that kind of thing in organic reaction mechanisms. And this can get quite tricky. This quote from Friedrich Wohler, who was one of the first organic chemists, one of the first to demonstrate that organic compounds could be made from non-living material, this quote really gives you a sense of the level of frustration associated with this field. And keep in mind, he was one of the first. This quote was probably said in the 1800s. And so imagine where we are now with uh, almost 200 years of organic chemistry history between Wohler and ourselves. So it can be a challenging subject, but one that I find extremely intellectually satisfying once you understand what's going on.